Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Maria Urtube, member of the Risk Advisors team. This group identifies economic considerations and leverages data and analytics to translate into industry insights and recommendations, supporting our clients during economic uncertainty while uncovering growth opportunities in consumer risk. I'm pleased to welcome back our panel of experts in the Risk Advisors Group, Dave Soika, Jesse Hardin, Tom O'Neill, and our practice leader, Thomas Aylin. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey, Hi, Maria. Maria. Good Good afternoon. The economy has made considerable progress, but inflation is still too high, said Jerome Powell at the press conference on April 3rd. Although not yet at the 2% goal, inflation has cooled off, allowing the Federal Reserve to shift its attention from raising rates to when to lower rates. Today, we will be focusing on interest rates, a topic that has been escalating the pain points list based on the feedback shared by our Market Pulse audience. For some of you, all of these economic terms are terms you hear and look into every day. For the rest of us, the Federal Reserve, referred to as the Fed, sets the federal fund rate, which is the interest rate at which banks in the U.S. lend money to each other. So it influences other interest rates in the economy, including rates on personal loans, mortgages, and saving accounts. And the reason the Fed adjusts, it, adjusts interest rates is to achieve its mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. How do the Fed interest rates affect the economy? It's a monetary policy tool. By raising or lowering interest rates, the Fed influences borrowing and spending in the economy. For example, the Fed raised uh, rates for, from almost zero two years ago to combat in rising inflation after hitting a 40-year record high. The last time it did so was last July. Raising interest rates cools off spending and the costs associated with the goods and services as a result. Conversely, when the economy is weak or inflation is low, the Fed may lower interest rates to stimulate borrowing and spending. So interest rates also affect borrowing costs, investment and saving, currency value, and of course, the housing market. We are currently experiencing the effect of home affordability from higher interest rates. Yet, the central bank's benchmark has remained unchanged, with federal rates in the range between five and a quarter and five and a half since last year. Powell continued to describe the U.S. economy overall as, and I quote again, one of solid growth, a strong but rebalancing labor market, and inflation moving down, end of quote. But he also painted the scenery as bump, a bumpy path. And we have heard that unwavering numbers would weaken the case for rate cuts this year. A chance of a recession would support interest rate cuts, a soft landing would not. The roadmap is not just bumpy. There are mixed signals along the way. I'm hoping my colleagues can shed some light on this today. Jesse, given all of this, what metrics should we be watching out for? Thanks, Maria. Yeah, I was was going to joke. Maybe we should just look at metrics from baseball because it seems like they're uh, there is there is a uh, up and down as as the metrics that we watch from uh, you know for interest rates. Um, I would you know say it's probably good to you know to mirror what the Fed's looking at or even what the what the interest rates uh, or sorry what the market's looking at. So looking at things like inflation, labor, spending, whether it's retail, goods, services, homes, autos, et cetera, all of those really, I think, have a role to play in the Fed's analysis, really, with the state of the economy. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge is going to be the PCE deflator. I know that sounds sounds technical. It's just uh, really, it's similar to CPI. Um, what it does is it just looks at a basket of goods and services. The big difference between PCE, which is the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, and CPI, which is the uh, Consumer Price Index, is really just the the weights that they put on the goods and services. So I think the you know the big difference um, that we've seen lately is that um, there's 
there's more of a focus on shelter, uh, certainly shelter being uh, the cost that it, that it takes to live, uh, where you live, where you rent, uh, where you own your own home. Those uh, you know those metrics have been elevated now, and it's and it's leading to inflation that's uh, making the Fed's uh, job you know pretty hard uh, to do. So, I think watching the PCE, watching things like the CPI, also for labor, looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics monthly report, that's going to give a good indication of the movement in the labor force from month to month. And economists are going to really watch that movement month to month to see you know how is our job market growing? What's the strength in the job market? They're going to look at things like the unemployment rate. You know, how's that moving? We mm-hmm. typically trend to a four percent unemployment rate for a healthy economy. So, are we, you know, are we close to that? Are we higher? Are we lower? And then I would say, you know, it's interesting how much visibility I think these these metrics are getting right now. And you know, really, a, a, a caveat would be that. We've talked about it before. It's always good to keep in mind the motivations that underlie the discussion in the public discord. So, you know, right now the Fed is obviously looking at um, these metrics maybe a little bit differently than somebody in the stock market would. You know, the Fed's really wanting to make sure that they see data that that indicates that inflation is in check, where the stock market's probably wanting to see, um, you know, a different set of metrics so that they can, you know, accurately judge when the um, the rate cuts are going to happen. And rate cuts are obviously more beneficial to the stock market. And so I think a good example would be, you know, there's there's a story the other day about an American CEO calling for an 8% Fed funds rate. And that's obviously a significant jump from where we are today. If you read the the article further, it really talks about the CEO talking about a range of rates to be prepared for and, and really that that's what they were doing within their company. So again, it really kind of, um, I, you know, I can't stress enough, you've got to know the underlying details of who you're listening to and kind of what they're focusing on uh, to, to really get a good picture, I think, of where interest rates and where inflation and some of these other metrics are really going. Thank you, Jesse. Um Following this general economic scenario, it's timely to turn over to more of the specifics. And this question is for you, Tom. What impact do changing interest rates have on banking? Well, there's, thanks for that, Maria. There's actually a pretty simple way of of, uh, answering that question. Unfortunately, reality is always a little more nuanced than, than simple. So I'll start with the simple part, you know, Increasing interest rates raise a bank's profit margin. So banks make money by by lending out you know, money to borrowers, and they charge an interest rate on that, obviously. And when interest rates go up, they're able to raise the interest rates on that, that money that they lend out. And in exchange, they, they get more for, for those higher interest rates. And it is true that, that, uh, that they also tend to raise interest rates on deposits and, and the other assets that they have that fund those loans. But raising on raising the interest rates on those tend to lag a bit behind and aren't aren't as fast as as uh, what is typically done when they raise interest rates on the lending activity. So so the short answer is rising interest rates increase profit margins, which is a good thing for banks. The more nuanced reality though is that it's it's more complicated than that usually rising interest rates as you explained in, in your introduction there um is a deliberate act to try and cool off the economy it's exactly what we're seeing right now with with the fed trying to you know to fight off inflation raising interest rates for the specific purpose of decreasing economic activity to try and rein in inflation um and as such you know there is correspondingly less commercial and consumer borrowing being done. So even if the profit margins on those those loans are are increasing, the amount of activity you know, may be decreasing you know, during the same time period. And then when you also factor in that, that typically associated with a cooling economy, you see other things like uh, a rise in delinquency rates and a rise in charge-offs. Um, it means that you know, fewer of those those loans are being paid, uh, and and so there's more risk and uh, expense associated with those. And there's also opportunity costs, you know, with uh, with rising interest rates. You know, if I lent out money yesterday at a lower interest rate, and now there's higher interest rates today, that's that's an opportunity that I've lost out on. You know, being able to take out that that uh, 
uh, that increased rates and and my current assets are are you know lower valued. So there's there's a lot of different things that that are mixed into this. Yeah, you know, to be able to say well, rising interest rates are good and and lowering interest rates are bad for banks. It's usually a, a mixed bag. Tom, and if rates were to be cut this year, what do you think the impact would be? Um, just as nuanced as what I just, uh, you know, I'd love to say that, you know, that, you know, we're going to see you know, multiple rate cuts and and banks will be happy and there will be, you know, dancing in the streets and, and you know, everyone filled with joy. But, but it all depends on so many different factors. I mean, what are the conditions when the Fed cuts rates? You know, when will the Fed cut rates? You know, how much will they cut it by? How many times will they cut it? Um, all of these things have an impact on not just the banking you know, approach, but the conditions that the, the banking industry is operating in. So, um, so again, would love to say that there's going to be dancing in the streets, but uh, we'll have to wait until further into the year to see if that actually happens. Uh, and Dave, given what we've heard from Tom, what, what is the sentiment in the mortgage environment? Well, I was going to ask Tom, is it Martha and the Vendellas or, or, or uh, Bowie and Jagger for dancing in the streets? Oh, I'm definitely going Martha. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Poor dancing by the two guys. Right? So um, I, I'm going to put away my dancing shoes, unfortunately, given the uh, the announcements uh, from the other day on where uh, inflation is at. Um, you know, the current situation right now is uh, our one of our most famous former presidential candidates, James McMillan the third had said rent is too damn high uh current rates as of april 1st of this year 30-year rates at 7.46 the 15 years at 6.68 and the 30-year jumbles at 7.49 um you know the rise in inflation has brought mortgage rates uh, to their highest rates uh, levels in uh, over 20 years and again that mortgage rate uh, for 30-year uh, fix is more than doubled what most were paying during 20 and 2021 and while mortgage rates aren't directly linked to the federal fund rate, they are influenced by how investors think the Fed moves will impact the broader economy. So as the rates go up, mortgage rates go up. As the rates go down, mortgage rates will eventually come down. Um, our recent credit trends data has shown that uh, the impact of this has been uh, mortgage origination volumes uh, have been decreasing you know, over uh, the course of 2023. But really, they've been in line with what we've seen from 2018 to 2021. 147 billion in, in originations, and then 1.2 million units uh, as of December uh, 2023. How are Americans uh, reacting to the higher rates? Uh, well, well, um, some are actually starting to uh, put down for discount points, which are a one-time fee paid at closing uh, to the lender in exchange for a lower interest rates. Uh, you know, paying that one uh, discount point is the equivalent of paying a fee of one percent of the loan amount. Um, but, and really, this is a, a hedge for, for borrowers uh, in terms of they're not sure um, how they're going to be able to afford the mortgage uh, in the future. So really, it's a hedge against uh, risk. Uh, but it's not always that common uh, in low rate environments. Um, one of the main drivers, too, has been, again, a supply issue. So we've talked about high interest rates and inflation, but also supply. And that's really driving up the prices, making affordability an ongoing issue. So the other uh, uh, thing that uh, Americans can do instead of purchasing home is rent. And when we compare uh, mortgage to rent, the average monthly mortgage payments, $174 uh, higher than the average rent uh, in the U S according to a study by home Bay. Um, if we look at, and again, it varies by, by region, by city. And if we look at a city's price to rent ratio, which again, looks at the price of, of rent relative to the price of mortgage, um, anything like really below uh, 15 means it's pretty good. If it's, it's, you know, if it's above 18, it, that's it's pretty high. And so 45 out of the 50 most populous uh, urban metro areas have a rent ratio of over 15, meaning it's actually better to rent than to buy. Housing in America is only getting more expensive, um, but home prices have increased more quickly than rent prices. Yeah. And, in that case, can we say the dancing in the streets is a common theme in mortgage as it is in banking? What are you expecting if rates were to be cut? Yeah. Um, well, I guess fortunately, uh, U.S. home prices declined in January for the third consecutive month due to higher borrowing costs, according to uh, S&P CoreLogic Case Shiller Home Price Index. 
but prices year over year jumped 6%, the fastest annual rate since 2022. Really, for housing to recover, uh, a couple of things have to happen. Um, first, obviously, we need to see the inventory of homes for sale turn considerably higher. There's a, a, a definite shortage, and really, that's in really new housing, uh, new houses being built. Obviously, mortgage rates would have to cool off. Um, experts think it might be imminent, but I think the, the recent uh, inflation news has definitely pushed that back to the, the uh, latter half of this year. Um, you know, mortgage rates really returning more normal, upper four to five percent would help the housing market and that kind of and go back to the levels that we saw back in 2014 and 2019. But it's really a, an additional balancing act for the Fed. Uh, cutting rates too quickly uh, lowers mortgage uh, interest rates, drives demand, higher demand drives up prices. So it's a real tough balancing act for the Fed. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Thomas, you shared with the Risk Advisor Steema a very different take on, on interest rates. Would you mind sharing your perspective for the auto vertical uh, with our Market Pulse audience? Yeah, definitely. And uh, you know, to quote another song uh, on the terms of interest rates, uh, Leanne Womack, uh, I hope you dance. So we'll see where we go with uh, with all these things. But uh, um, you know, as, as it relates to um, some of the most important things in the auto market, uh, the Payment to income, you know, after the credit score has been one of the key drivers in terms of understanding downstream payment risk. So when we think about what that means, um, is you have a monthly payment for a vehicle, and then you have the income for the person. We know things where things have gone, how they've occurred, and the inflation that has occurred within the uh, automotive space for both new and used vehicles was really quite high, outpacing regular inflation by some you know dramatic margin. So the impacts to the overall monthly payment uh, was. Uh, more impactful in the auto space, you know, with a payment to income ratio being higher uh, as incomes were not keeping pace with the inflation associated with uh, with that space in particular. So as we're looking at it, you know, if we end up seeing, uh, you know, some form of, you know, decline in the total, you know, price of vehicles, uh, you know, we, you know, we may see that, you uh, people are better off in terms of being able to either refinance or you know do do something with that and on the interest rate side you know 100 basis point drop you know that that's that's going to be a fraction of a, of a monthly payment compared to the overall uh you know payment but what it does though is it does create a a sentiment and over the life of the loan from an amortization standpoint it does create a massive opportunity for refinance uh as well as uh, new origination so as we you know explore some of those things i think the the places to definitely watch and to understand are you know, where is the loan to value setting? Where's the payment to income setting? And, you know, how does it fit within the current, uh, you know, credit uh, you know, structure that uh, someone might have? And, and that's going to be regardless of where, where rates end up going. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Jesse, your general uh, economic insight got the discussion started. How should we interpret the Fed's latest communication in closing? Yeah, Maria, I'll take that. But first, I want to I want to highlight that was uh, pretty cool to hear Thomas quoting a uh, country western singer. Mm -hmm. So pretty pretty awesome there. Um, you know what I would say is when we think about the the velocity of all the comments coming out of of you know the Fed about what's happening in the economy and the you know in the markets, it's good to I think probably look at some of the latest remarks. I think as you had said, Maria. The uh, April third remarks from Jerome Powell were probably some of the you know some of the the remarks that get I guess looked at the most. Uh, so Jerome Powell was at Stanford Graduate School of Business, I guess go Cardinals. Um, but in those remarks, he in reinforced a couple of points that we can hit on, and, and I want to quote them just uh, so there's really nothing lost in translation. So the first thing he said is quote labor market rebalancing is evident in data on quits, job openings, surveys of employers and workers, and the continued gradual decline in wage growth. And I think what he's saying there is just the um, that the labor market is coming to a, a more of a normalization where you know a typical uh, growth number like a, a three month moving average you know could be 250,000 jobs or so and and so we're we're seeing that normalization uh, you know in the, in the labor market and, and that's a good thing you know there's uh, as we looked at where um, where the economy was going when it was so hot you know labor and spending were kind of the the keys that um, you know that really caused more of this concern and so that normalization again in the labor market is something we definitely want to see. 
He also said, we do not expect that we will, uh, that it'll be appropriate to lower our policy rate until we have greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably towards 2%, given the strength of the economy and the progress on inflation so far, we have time to let incoming data guide our decisions on policy. Again, I think reiterating that the um, the data is going to kind of dictate when the move needs to happen. So I, I think, you know, some in the market have, uh, in the stock market may have said, you know, the goalpost seems to be moved a little bit. You know, we were trying to get closer to 2%, and now you're saying we need to hit 2%. And so um, I think really what we're hearing is just that the data needs to indicate that that inflation is really in check. And as we see these hot inflation reports coming out, I think that's what, um, you know, what's calling into question, you know, how inflation is, is really moving. He did reiterate that if the economy evolves broadly as as, as, as is expected, especially with the FOMC participants, uh, you know, indicating so the the different governor, the, the Fed governors that, um, that, that offer their opinion as well, it seems likely to be appropriate to begin lowering policy rates at some point this year. And so I think that's going to continue to, you know, kind of show that uh, that that the 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 move is towards rate cuts. It's just a question of does the data show that it's time to do that. Um, prior to the the report that we saw, the CPI report out uh, April tenth, the um, CME Fed Watch tool, which is kind of like a prediction of uh, likelihood of rate cuts, was showing a sixty three and a half percent probability of a, of at least a twenty five basis point cut in June. Looks like that's probably off the table now as a result of you know the heat that we've seen over the last three or so. Uh, CPI reports, and so you know, I think again, continue to watch the 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 you know the velocity of those reports as they come in, um, and then a couple other things. So you know, these inflation reports have come in pretty uh, with with uh, an emphasis on how some of the service costs are really sticky, and so I think that's going to really cause the Fed to really look at that data closely and and you know really determine how does uh, how does that. Uh, data indicate a move needs to happen, uh, you know, in the in the uh, rate cuts. And then lastly, I think just not forgetting that the uh, presidential election is coming through. And so in terms of timing, you know, that's that's always a, a play as well as the Fed's going to really try to refrain from any large movements or any movements for that matter around that election time. Thank you, Jesse. It seems we have a bumpy uh, path ahead. We're not there yet, but we are hopeful that we'll be dancing when we do. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're practicing right now. We're practicing in our yeah. homes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, Dave, Jesse, Thomas, for your participation. To our listeners, thank you for joining us. If you have questions or suggestions for future podcasts, uh, please reach out to us at riskadvisors at equifax.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Until next time.